Yep. You need to make it right. Okay, Lord, please forgive me. Am I forgiven? Yes. And he says, Tim, you need to make it right. The issue is not, do I need to confess my sins in the past? The issue now is, God is asking me to go do something of righteousness. It's not about the sin, it's about will I do what he's asking me to do now. And every day I walk back and forth through this big yard between the school and where I live, and it's like God drew a target on it and said, every time he walks through there, I'm going to nail him. And every time, you need to go make that right, Tim. Finally said, okay, Lord, I will. Next time I go to Michigan, I'll take care of it. I never intended to go back to Michigan in my life. It's easy to say, tell God something you know is never, not going to happen, except God knows more than we do. <laughs> and he wasn't going to let up on me. He said, write a letter. But God, I don't know the address. Write a letter anyway. So I pulled out a piece of paper, a piece of stationery, and I wrote, Dear Fellow Human. I didn't know who I was writing to. And I wrote a letter about how God had changed my life and I didn't want anything I had done or left undone to separate somebody else from God. And I told them about breaking into their house, taking the bottles, and even at the bottom of it, I put a P.S. Let me know what I owe you. Do you know how much a college student has in a Christian school that's putting themselves through school? <laughs> that's really hard to put on there. Tell me what I owe you because I didn't have anything to give anybody. All I had was debt. Doing my best to stay in school. And uh, so I mailed it. No, actually... God told me to mail it. Now, how do you mail a letter that you don't know the address for? I said, I can't mail it, Lord. He said, yes, you can. Draw a map. Okay. I'll draw a map. I put a T on the thing. Whoops. And I put northeast corner. And I had the name of the two roads. It's the nearest farm to the northeast corner. That was handy. I could remember that. And at the time, I could remember the roads, which I can't remember anymore. And I put the name of the nearest town, which happened to be Hinchman, Michigan. And I got a zip code for Hinchman, Michigan and mailed it. You know what it's like to put a written confession in a mailbox of a felony and then let go of it and it goes down around that corner and you can't pull it back out? It's not fun. I wanted to, but I couldn't. Uh, okay, Lord, it's all in your hands. I'm expecting to get it back with insufficient address stamped all over the thing. That's what I was hoping for. It didn't come back. And it didn't come back. And it didn't come back. I finally decided somebody probably kept it as a souvenir in the post office. A couple of months later, I walked into my room and I picked up off the floor a letter that was from Redlands, California, from a man I didn't know. I thought, what is this? It's addressed to me and it's got the address right. I pull it out and my stomach does a flip-flop. It tries to squeeze out through my throat. Why would just seeing this piece of paper do that? Well, you have to understand, it starts out and says, Dear Fellow Human. The light blue ink is my writing. This is a letter from the late 70s. The dark blue writing is somebody else's, and there's a lot more dark blue than there's light blue. He even wrote on here, I have plenty of paper, why write here? Because God had a mission for the letter. You see, that letter that I had sent went to Michigan to the wrong city for where that farm was. I had the wrong city, but somehow it got to the right city, and then from there it got to the guy who owned the farm, not in Michigan, but out in California. And I was really excited because it starts out by saying, yes, there is powerful, wonderful power in the blood. I got a Christian. Yes, thank you, Lord. <laughs> And he goes on and he forgives me for this. And he asks me to share the gospel with the guy that broke and entered with me. And then he said, I don't mean for this check to embarrass you, but it's for tuition or otherwise. And I looked back in the envelope and there was a check for $50. And he asked about the worthy student fund of my school and I sent him a letter and he never answered back because he died right after mailing this. Now, I shared that story in Ohio. I thought I was safe. 
I used the man's name. I mean, Ohio's quite a few hours away from Michigan because uh, I was in Eastern Ohio and the story happened in Western Michigan and I thought that's far enough away. And you noticed I didn't use the guy's name today. There was a man who got up and met me at the door after the sermon that I'd used that illustration in. He says, I don't believe your story. I said, why not? He said, I know that man. He hates Christians and Seventh-day Adventists in particular. I don't believe he wrote a letter like that. I pulled out the letter and said, you look at it. <laughs> I said, all I know is what I have. He read it and he says, okay. I learned later that this guy that wrote the letter was a drinking buddy of my friend's dad, the friend that broke in with me. They were drinking buddies and they both hated Christians and Seventh-day Adventists in particular. What happened? I don't know. I hope to find out in the kingdom. But I'm wondering if a letter shows up to a guy that says, Dear fellow human, and talks about the gospel, got his attention, and he accepted Jesus Christ before he died. Amen. And he knew I was an Adventist because I'm at Southwestern Adventist University, and that's where he wrote the letter to. Isn't God special? Did God use my worst for his best? Yes. Yeah, but he wasn't done. One day I was preaching in Hagerstown, Maryland, where I was the pastor at the time, and my friend walks into the balcony. The last I'd known, he was in Colorado, and the last I knew, he wasn't attending a church anywhere. He was following his dad's footsteps. Thankfully, his dad eventually came back to church. That's how I got more of the story. But he sits in the balcony with his wife, and I'm preaching, and I'm thinking, if this guy leaves during the sermon, I'm leaving during the sermon. He is not getting away. <laughs> and uh, during the closing song, he starts down the balcony steps, and I left the platform, and I met him out in the foyer, and I invited him home for lunch. And he is not a Christian. He doesn't want to talk about spiritual things, but he came to church just to meet me. And so we talk about things, and I've got this bottle case in the corner. I said, hey, Remember the day, and I pulled out a bottle, that we got these? He goes, yeah. I said, you need to know the rest of the story. I pulled this letter out. I said, read the light blue ink and then the dark blue ink. He very uncomfortably read it. But he read it. Then he didn't want to talk about it, and he headed for Colorado, driving a borrowed motorhome. He got back to Colorado, headed down a little alley while returning it, put a little crease down the side of a car with the bumper of the motorhome. Didn't hurt the motorhome at all left this nice gouge down the side of this car. He looked around, nobody saw him. He got back in the motorhome and drove on. He told me later, Tim, all I could think about was that crazy letter you had me read. He went back to the car, put a note on the car and said, I don't have insurance. I was borrowing a bar driving a borrowed vehicle when I hit your car, but I do body work. Would you let me fix your car? And he left his name and phone number. They called him, let him fix their car. The next thing I heard about my friend, he was singing in a gospel quartet. <laughs> he hasn't had an easy life, but God's still there with him. And you know what? God uses everything for good. So what's the worst thing you've ever done? Don't spend your energy trying to hide it. Give it to God and then do whatever God asks you to do with it. You don't have to do anything if He doesn't ask you to do anything. But if He does, will you listen and obey His voice? Because friends, when you give it to God and ask Him to use it for good, He will. That's a wonderful thing. Let Him use it for good. Now, if I had a church and I am pastoring somewhere, and somebody comes up and said, Tim, I found out that you broke and entered into a house. If you don't do things my way, I'm going to tell. I would look at them and laugh. Who are you going to tell? I've already told all kinds of people about it. God's already used it for good. Who are you going to tell and try and use it for evil? Do you see what happens? As soon as we let God have our bad in the past, He uses it for good, and Satan can't use it against us because God's already using it for good. 
You don't have to waste any energy hiding from what God uses for good, do you? You don't have to hide. You can't be emotionally or spiritually blackmailed if you've given it to Jesus Christ. That's the healthy, happy Christian life. You ask Him to change you, forgive your sins, change you from the inside out, and then He uses it all for good. Why do we need to be upset and disheartened when He does it all for good? We're going to close by singing Redeemed. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. I hope that you are forgiven and renewed because that's what it takes to be ready to meet Jesus Christ. Three thirty eight, shall we stand for the closing song?